Funding for Working Lunch is provided by the financial contributions of viewers like you. Additional funding is provided by First Bank, McGuire Woods Consulting, and Fidelity Investments. Join us today for a great conversation with some leading citizens from North Carolina's forest product industry. Here in North Carolina, significant employer, important part of our economy. So pull up a chair and join us for today's Working Lunch. Working Lunch is a production of UNC-TV in association with the North Carolina Free Enterprise Foundation. In today's Working Lunch, we have a great assortment of folks from the forest products industry in North Carolina. So let's get started. Nancy, tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. Thank you for having us. I'm Nancy Thompson. I work with Warehouser. Warehouser is one of the world's largest forest products company. We own and sustainably grow about 13 million acres of trees worldwide, 600,000 acres here in North Carolina. We also make a variety of wood products from lumber to oriented strand board. Um, we produce fluff pulp or cellulose fiber at our facility in New Bern. And we have a seedling nursery in Washington, North Carolina. Hmm. Bruce, what about your company? Uh, I'm a forester, procurement forester for Jordan Lumber and Supply in Mount Gilead. It's a pine sawmill. Generally does two by fours, two by sixes, but we do specialty products for uh, Lowe's. We develop several new products for them. Uh, we own roughly 80,000 acres of our land that we manage, uh, timber harvest annually on a sustained basis. Um, and we produce about four and a half, five million feet a week. Hmm. Perry, what about your company? Uh, Perry Hunt, President of Hunt for Free Sources. We're a logging and timber company um, and one of the state's largest firewood producers as well. Um, we harvest timber uh, all over the state doing many aspects of harvesting regimes as far as thinning, select cuts, and final harvest and we do uh, replanting throughout the state as well. Fred, what about your company? Fred Harden, registered forester with Gilkey Lumber Company. We're in the western end of the state. We're have the South Mountain Range to the east and the Appalachians to the north and west. Family owned operation that's been on the same site since 1954, focused on the sawing and kiln drying of red oak, white oak, yellow poplar for domestic and global markets, increasingly the global markets. Mm. We're be able to be there with all that time with even a much larger mill in the area because our product is renewable and sustainable. That sustainable growth gives us markets that know when they come to us, we can apply that same product graded to international standards on a regular and consistent basis, which is a huge benefit for the Appalachian hardwoods, which are some of the most desirable in the world for the production of flooring, furniture, the parts of a house that you see, not the interior parts that you don't see. We don't saw yellow pine, well, and we find that to be um, unique in the industry as to how we produce lumber, dry it, and get it to the markets. You know, this is an industry with a long and storied history in North Carolina. It's a significant part of our economy, but most people don't understand the extent to which it is a part of North Carolina's business climate. W w tell us a little bit about this as an industry. Our industry is a $20 billion industry for the state of North Carolina. We are the largest manufacturing um, industry in the state. We have about 75,000 direct workers and of course many, many thousands indirect workers. Um, about 19 million acres of land in North Carolina are forest land and mostly privately owned, private citizens ownership. Um, we are the largest exporter of wood products, wood, wood products in the country. North Carolina is. Mm. So we are definitely a, a big deal for the state of North Carolina. Well, a big employer involved in a lot of different aspects of the economy. But what, what are some of the challenges you face as a company? Just everyday activities. Uh, making sure the public understands what we're doing is, is good for not only the environment for them. I mean, uh, we touch their lives every day, every way, uh, from things you eat to the clothes you wear. So we are a very vital part of the society. And are you facing particular challenges in today's marketplace? We are, um, and, and I think some of those marketplaces are actually a derivative of some of the, the, the public not understanding exactly what we are doing as an industry. So the finished product goods that North Carolina produces is massive. We, we cover the, the whole gambit of all the different products, uh, but 
we want the people in North Carolina to really understand how detrimental that correct forest management from the beginning to the end is to making sure that, that the whole process is important. So from landowners making the investment to replant trees, to understanding that loggers have to come out there and actually gonna harvest trees, to actually getting it to the market through trucking capacity, and then those markets taking, going through their process to produce the products. We feel like that's, a, that's the whole process everybody needs to understand is, is integral to how, how forest products are produced in North Carolina. So you're in the western part of North Carolina, some significant challenge topographically uh, harvesting trees there versus in the eastern North Carolina where just about everything is flat. What, what are some of the challenges that you face just getting your product to the market? Because of the terrain, because of the uh, access and roads, we are not able to mechanize as they have eastern our logging crews are maturing. They are actually aging out. The restrictions on insurance have them downsizing from a five-man crew to a two-man crew. The public loves our forest. They're loving them to death. Our forests are becoming an 80 to 100-year-old crown canopy closed ecosystem. We are beginning to lose wildlife. This is the canary in the coal mine that you hear about. We have seen dramatic declines in tropical songbirds. We are seeing dramatic declines in rough grouse. We are seeing dramatic declines in white-tailed deer. All of this is a function of the public generally does not want to see a harvest. We can see a harvest there for 15 miles, where for in the east, you may not concede 100 yards off the road. If we are not able to sustain these young growth forests to get these wildlife populations back in balance, we're gonna start losing some of our tourism dollars, some of our other industries that are closely aligned with the forest products industry. And it's a, it's a great concern going forward. We, we directly impact 50 logger families now at just our mill. 10 years ago, we impacted 80 logger families. We see this as a, a major concern for the industry and how do we get that product if people are going to want to hold on to it, how are you gonna get it to the mill? Is it gonna be the uh, lucrative opportunity for maybe a one-time sale to put your child through college to build a new home? Are you gonna have the logger out there to get it to the market? Nancy, your company is a big landowner in Eastern North Carolina. What, what are there, some of the challenges that you face from your company's perspective? Warehouse Res, certainly unlike um, Gilkey in the western part, all of our ownership is east of 95. So in North Carolina, for Warehouser, all of our ownership is, is what Fred was just describing, the flat. Um, uh, certainly, you know, weather impacts have been a big deal. You know, when you have all of your ownership in areas that are, you know, affected by hurricanes, that's, you know, temporary, but, um, and forests are resilient like that and withstanding a lot. But um, that's kind of a recent immediate impact and concern. Um, however, things like, you know, when you uh, see the, uh, Commissioner of Agriculture changing the um, weight limits or the access, that's a, that's a big deal to get harvest out of woods ahead of a storm or for other row crop agriculture. You know, that was a big deal. Um, infrastructure is a big deal, and we've talked a lot about that in, in various ways in the North Carolina Forestry Community Association and others, and the changes to the highway system for interstate designations, it's important that those um, North Carolina weights are recognized, um, you know, the, the weight systems that we enjoy and, and potentially increase. Well, you know, Perry, people don't think of this industry as being complicated. You grow trees, you cut trees, you cut them into lumber, but the truth is it's a highly regulated industry and that presents its own kind of challenges. What, what are you finding? Well, one thing that, that uh, is actually on the table right now is, is the federal interstate systems that are um, in North Carolina. So there are some proposed state highways that, that are getting to be turned over to the federal, um, federal system. And that would be a detriment to our industry because a lot of those major highways are actually um, are, are right off from the major paper mills, um, major log mills, um, and for them to put restrictions from a federal standpoint on the wood products industry would, would be detrimental from a cost perspective to us. 
So if it if it would and from a safety concern as well, that that's that's one of the bigger bigger issues here, because if if uh, the the feds got involved with a lot of our state highways, then you would have log trucks and other major trucks having to not go on those interstate systems. They would have to be finding other offsetting roads to get to, because to get to those mills which are off the major the major highways they'd have to be going through small towns. And we don't want to be driving a log truck, an 18-wheeler through small towns. It's just not safe. So we'd rather stick to the main road systems in North Carolina. So that's one of the biggest things that I'd like to see our General Assembly recognize as something that we need to kind of push with the federal government to make sure they realize that we need, if, they're, if, if the state feels like from a financial perspective, they need to get the feds to help out with our state road systems, then they need to allow the wood products industry to still have the same, the same guidelines that we currently have within the state to be able to operate on those federal interstate systems. Right. Well, Bruce, what do you find in your company in terms of workforce? Are you getting the quality of worker you need? To, I know there's a lot of training that goes in to these particular jobs. We've been fortunate in being able to uh, find uh, a steady workforce. Uh, the teacher tours that the NCFA does during the summer, we've been fortunate enough to be involved with all those that have come through. And it's really amazing to watch the teachers and their interaction. We try to get to a live logging operation, and they have everybody has watched Axeman on TV. Well, it's a little <laughs> sensationalized the way they do it. In reality, uh, they're amazed to see the machine that cuts the trees, the feller bunchers, you know, carry it around and place it in a pile. They have no idea. Well, where's the man with the chainsaw? We don't have a chainsaw. Everything today is mechanical. And these youngins that are in high school that have good hand-eye coordination, those are the people that are gonna be in demand because everything is, is electric over hydraulic now and you've got to have good hand-eye coordination in order to do it. So. Fred, we were talking earlier about your experience teaching young children about the, this industry. Tell us again of that story. You tried herding cats. <laughs> Get 300 fifth graders outside when you have um, a great day and they're there to see what different um, positions and jobs are out in the rural and how that affects. The teachers are given a lesson plan that isn't developed out of what's going on on the ground in North Carolina. The impression they have is our forests are gone, that we're losing our forest when actually we have more forest land than we had a hundred years ago because our forests are renewable and sustainable. The message that we try to give to them is yes we are and yes we can and yes we will. If you want to be uh, looking at a career down the road for a fifth grader, which is awful hard to convince, they're there for you. At our mill, we have roughly 50 employees. 20% of our employees have been there 20 years or longer. We bring a great value to the community. These are um, jobs that, as we're saying, these are becoming highly skilled positions. It's not robotic, but you have to have a very good understanding of scanning and optimization you have to have very good skills as being able to fix hydraulics and welding on the fly. These jobs pay well, they have good benefits, and that is one of the reasons we have such good employer retention. Um, I think that's, that's the message is this is not history. I mean, you know, we don't do things with the oxen and the horse that we did 100 years ago. This is modern day, and this, these are really good jobs. Right. So. We don't have a disease or anything. I, Bruce, to your point, and Fred, to your point, um, uh, I saw a recent statistic that said since 1974, our timber land has actually grown 50% larger than it was at that point. To me, that's, that's a, huge, a huge point to kind of build off of. So we, we want our, our young kids of today that are coming out of school to understand how important our industry is and we need our politicians to understand how important our industry is. The growth that is in it is substantial. And we have a major, major natural resource here in North Carolina. And it is a resource 
that provides substantial amount of employment and a substantial amount of tax revenue to the state and to the federal level and on a local level. So we need to, we need to make sure that, that the kids today realize how mechanized we are. It's not the days of old, like you said, Bruce, how mechanized we are, and they are great paying jobs. And it's important for these kids today to realize not just from the pay rate perspective, but actually how important this job is throughout the state and to the environment and the, and the whole local economy. It, 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 is, it is an important position to be in. Well, we, we've talked a lot about some of the challenges you face now. W what is the future of this industry? What are the things that you see happening over the next 10 years? I, you know, we've got an incredible opportunity, and we have. If you've not had the chance to go see the Tryon Palace History Center, I was able to take my children there. It's got this really neat interactive exhibit that talks about colonial forestry in that part of the world. It talks, you can, you can um, virtually load a turpentine ship and sail it to England. And it's, it's really neat when you look, sit there and look at how this industry has evolved from colonial days to now and what we have going forward in our future. And it's bright and it's exciting and it's modern and it's, and it's interactive and it's, it's still now as big of an impact if not more as it was on North Carolina's economy than it was in the 1700s. And um, you know, the, the best thing I think about our industry is that we're solutions. You know, wood products and wood um, and forest products are solutions for the world, whether or not it's housing needs, whether or not it's hygiene, baby diapers, um, pens, pencils, their cellulose and toothpaste. <laughs> I mean, it's exciting to think about all the things um, that our forest products do now and can do, and the fact that our products sequester carbon. You know, there's, there's all this concern about carbon and carbon emissions, and what a better way to do that than a wood, wood product. Um, so I think the future is bright. Um, you know, my friends here have talked about teaching teachers and children, um, and I think we're going to need those bright young minds who probably still have in their, you know, they want to play a video game now, and how exciting can, can they think it's really going to be a future in this industry, and I think it's very exciting. We're going to need all of that talent, all of that imagination, and more, but um, forest products have been around a long time and will continue to be. What other challenges do you see going forward? I just think educating the public. Making sure everybody has an open mind, ask questions. You know, our company, the Lions Clubs of the world, the Rotary Clubs, the Garden Clubs, anybody that asks, we try to give a tour. And we'll go from the cradle to the grave, you know, from an uh, ugly clear cut to planting the trees to the whole cycle, manufacturing in the mill to help people understand that it is not the end of the world when the trees are cut, that's only the beginning. At least that's the way we look at it anyway. It's the I think that's an important perspective too. I mean, harvesting trees, you know, to some people's eyes may not look as beautiful as a field of cotton. But I can tell you a field of cotton or most agricultural crops, they're absolutely lovely to look at. And standing trees are lovely to look at. But at some point, that farmer has to harvest that cotton. They have to harvest that corn. We have to harvest our trees, and it's important to the whole ecology that's going around. From the wildlife that Fred brought up, it's important to make sure we, we find that correct rotation in those trees and we harvest so, so we can allow other forms of wildlife to continue to grow. And um, if, if, if the public can understand and if if we can reach out to them and we invite them at all times to come to the NCFA, to come to, to, come to our yard. I'm, I'm happy to talk to them and I, like everybody else is here too because it only helps our job to inform the public of everything that, that we can provide them. Please don't, you know, we don't want people making a judgment call just based on what they see. We want them to get educated, you know, ask questions of why does it look this way? I'm happy to talk to them and discuss why things look a certain way. There's a process that we have to go through to actually achieve, you know, uh, the finished products. And one thing that's important as well is, is that uh, growing trees is an investment. Just like what anybody else does uh, from investing in stocks, they, they are investing to make a certain return on investment. Well, people grow trees for the exact same purpose. So it's important for them to be able to harvest those trees and get that certain return on investment. And I tell you, that, that is a big deal in North Carolina, especially for Weyerhaeuser. 
Um, you know, they grow us, a, I think y'all are, are y'all the largest private, private, landowner, in the private state, landowner in the state. Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes to show you that there's obviously good returns in, in growing and harvesting timber. Well, it's a great point. What, what would you wish policymakers, elected officials from Raleigh and Washington, that they better understood about your industry? What don't they know that would make them better at making the rules and regulations for your industry? What works in Washington State, in Oregon, is not necessarily what works in North Carolina. We have a whole different market base, but we still have a lot of government overreach that wants to put in a one-size-fits-all. This transfers right up to the national forest level, which were set aside for wildlife, timber, mining, resource, and recreation. They are becoming heavily a recreation base. We need to get into the understanding of not just what the forester and the forestry community is saying is happening, but listen to what the wildlife people are telling you. Understand what we're doing now is it's just as important for next week's market as it is for 20 to 30 years down the road for the next generations that are coming forward. When we started with the dry kilns at Gilkey 35 years ago, that gave us ex access to the export markets. We did just some of our highest grade, highest end oaks into Europe and Japan. Now we are 80% export of all grades to the global markets. I would like to thank John Hammond with the North Carolina Department of Ag for his work to connect people with markets here and markets overseas. He is constantly looking to introduce those markets to mills now that are trying to transition from the loss of the domestic markets to the export side. It's interesting that the population generally thinks of, oh, you're shipping our lumber to China and they're just sending it back cheap. Now so, because China has those jobs in manufacturing, their economy for their people have improved, now they're buying that. That wood that's going to Shanghai and Jingdao is staying in China for those people. We need jobs. We need manufacturing. Somehow our legislative bodies need to understand what is going to bring those jobs around and why it's important to be able to keep those jobs in North Carolina and not just farm them out. Warehouse are a significant presence here in North Carolina, but actually an international company. So what is it you would wish that policymakers and regulators would understand better about this industry? We, um, we are certainly a big presence in the country and beyond um, and in North Carolina. You know, I, th I think one of our biggest challenges is not unlike our friends in ag or other industries, and that is that we don't grow our trees in downtown Charlotte or downtown Raleigh. Um, it's important, we see the population base, of course, going to the urban areas of the state, but we need and hope that our elected leaders understand that our, our needs in rural North Carolina, where, the, where this industry is supported, where we grow trees, where we have pulp mills, where we have paper mills, where we have lumber mills, we need them to understand that the needs there are different. And that can be infrastructure from something that seems as, um, I guess as minor as running high speed fiber optic cable to our facility in Plymouth, North Carolina, that's actually taking much longer than it should. And it's, you know, needs like that that we just can't think of in downtown Raleigh or Charlotte um, to roads and, and, and beyond. So um, just realizing that our, our industry's needs are unique and that we are largely very rural and it's not the same need that you're going to have in urban areas. Barry, if you had that chance, one conversation with a legislator here in North Carolina better understand your company, what would you tell them? I, I would say that they need to understand some of the permitting process that we have to go through. So with, with in our industry, uh, it's an ever-changing industry and ever-changing for the good, especially for North Carolina, based on all the resources that we have. So if with the ever-changing industry that we have and with it constantly moving, we need to be able to constantly adapt as far as some of the industry folks. So if, if there's a way to kind of expedite permitting process locally and from a state level that could help us evolve into the industry in a better way so that we could help increase some of the revenues in North Carolina with the economy and taxes, it'd be a, it'd be a great stepping stone for us to you know, continue to move forward. Bruce, any other final thoughts on things you wish regulators and legislators understood? 
I'd just like to extend the invitation to any of them to come climb in the truck. <laughs> Let me have a chance to talk to you one on one. I mean, most of them have a better confidence level of sticking their food in a microwave and it coming out hot and tasty than they do what foresters do on an everyday, every day of their life. Right. And it definitely affects everybody's life. So give us a chance to explain. And to Susan's point earlier that, that we are the major exporter of lumber and forest products, um, our port is not. Wilmington is, has been talked about, kicked down the can down the road. We're going to build it, we're going to make it. Most of our forest products from here are going out of Norfolk, Charleston, and Savannah. Let's get this Wilmington port up to standards because imports and exports are going to be a, a reality. We need that port system expanded to be able to handle our own uh, exports out of North Carolina. The great conversation with some great North Carolina business leaders in a very important industry to our state's economy. Thank you for joining us for this work and lunch today. Thank, Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Guys, okay. enjoy. Funding for Working Lunch is provided by the financial contributions of viewers like you. Additional funding is provided by First Bank, McGuire Woods Consulting, and Fidelity Investments. Working Lunch is a production of UNC-TV in association with the North Carolina Free Enterprise Foundation.